the uh, Dynamics of Faith by Paul Tillich. I want to apologize because I read this book, uh, oh, I've read it off and on since I first read it in 1977, and um, I forgot how difficult the book is. So what I wanted to do tonight, I'm going to give a slow introduction to the Dynamics of Faith. I want to give a slow introduction to this book, and first I want to say uh, this book written in 1956 uh, Paul Tillich was, was uh, born in 1876, so uh, if my calculations are correct, he was 60 when he wrote the book. Now, uh, uh, if I made a mistake, someone please correct me immediately. Uh, up until that time, uh, he grew up in a small town. Uh, today would be outside of Berlin, but it was a rural town then. A uh, very strict Lutheran upbringing. Um, He lived in a walled city, uh, had a humanistic education, even though his father was a rather authoritarian uh, Lutheran minister. He spent a lot of time out in the uh, forest, so he had these three deep parts of his life, Uh, his Protestant faith, a very biblical faith, uh, a a very intellectual, but we would say over here, an intellectual form of fundamentalism. Uh, He had a humanistic education, which was, you can think anything, you can say anything, uh, you can engage in the conversation that's been going on since Plato and Aristotle. Uh, It's hard for us to imagine when I think about the things that we philosophize about today. Uh, But there was a time when people philosophized, when you went to university, that's what you did. You philosophized about uh, Plato and Aristotle and the Stoics, and the Church Fathers. These were the essential things that people had to know about to participate in the great conversation. Now, even if you were, remember in those days, everybody went to church. And every good, every good pastor, every good scholar, uh, that person was also well-educated in the, uh, the depth of the Western tradition, especially how it interfaced with uh, Christian faith. Uh, unless you study this, it's hard to imagine how seriously people took the world of ideas. Now, uh, when Tillich comes along at the end of the 19th century, and again, you'd, you'd have to go transport yourself back, either through your re- reading or uh, some other mystical, magical way that I can't conceive, you have to go back to a time when Kant was on the front pages, when uh, somebody had finally discussed in an almost... Uh, in opposable way, the nature of consciousness, the connection between our thinking, our subjectivity, and the world out there. Now, this question has bedeviled uh, philosophers ever since there was philosophy. Uh, You still hear sophomores talking about it as if Kant never existed. That's okay. That's why we have the word sophomoric. Uh, But but Kant is just stupendous. I remember when I, I was reading Kant, even after all these many years, it was, I would, I remember the hair would stand up on the back of my head, and and I would get shivers watching what Kant was leading us toward about the nature of of our inner lives, and how our inner lives uh, connected with the world through what he called categories of uh, perception. And remember, Kant himself is at the, 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 the pinnacle of a long history of of uh, philosophy and theology, which again was taken utterly seriously. In fact, many of you know that what we call today science, science of physics, science of uh, astronomy, mathematics, that was folded into uh, the theology because it was understood that anything we understood about the world, especially mathematics and physics, were themselves the voice of God manifesting itself in the world. So the idea that there is a distinction between science on one hand and religion on the other did not exist up until the uh, 19th century. Uh, Tillich grows up at a time when Hegel has written his great works, and not to try to summarize Hegel, but an essential question was, if Kant has understood the categories of perception and how perception relates to the uh, known world, Hegel's question is, well, what about spirit? Uh, you know, what about psychology? What about personality? Aren't those modes of perception? And what does God have to do with it? And is there something spiritual coursing through us? 
And does that create a kind of uh, perception? Uh, Hegel dies in 1830, but again, a stupendous figure in the history of uh, Western thought. Uh, Tillich grows at, grows uh, up in a time when many other great philosophers, but especially Nietzsche and the profundity of, of uh, what became existentialism, the world of Freud and the way that Freud, in, in a way, uh, uh, tore apart many of the foundations of religion for uh, the, those who weren't willing to take Freud seriously. Jung uh, had done his work as, uh, uh, as uh, Paul Tillich was going through life. Uh, a transformative moment in Tillich's life, he was uh, an ordained uh, minister. Uh, he, his college years were 1912 to 1916, if I'm not mistaken. And in those years, he, everything that I'm talking about here, especially the philosophy of Schelling, who was a contemporary and, and uh, a debate, uh, in, in debate with, uh, with Hegel, he, he sided with Schelling. This is what he did his undergraduate degree in. He took all this utterly, utterly seriously. And then the First World War breaks out, and um, he's a chaplain, but he's up front, and he sees the carnage, he sees the, the, the senseless brutality, and especially at that time, fighting over nothing, killing over nothing, carnage over nothing. No one could actually say what they were fighting over. So this, uh, when Freud in, uh, adds to his idea thanatology, uh, which means the, the, derive, the, the drive to death, the drive to destruction. This was the mood in Germany in the 1920s. What is a human being? What have we missed? It's, it's beyond what Kant or Hegel or Schelling could have possibly imagined. Uh, it might be in the, in the darker reaches of Nietzsche and the darker works, works of Freud. So in the 1920s is a time of, uh, again, just an explosion in German uh, philosophy. Uh, Heidegger is writing at this time, so those of you who found parts of uh, Dynamics of Faith uh, uh, hard going, that's, that's Tillich trying to deal with Heidegger, and Heidegger is almost impenetrable unless you see Heidegger as a, you know, where his thought comes from and his struggle with being and non-being and uh, so forth. Uh, so this is Tillich, and um, uh, Tillich, whose ideas that I'm going to just share a few ideas, uh, are already in embryonically in faith. Uh, he was uh, an outspoken critic of Nazism, and he says he has the honor of being, uh, of the, when the Jews were expelled from, the Jewish academics were expelled from Germany in 1933 because of their critique of the regime, uh, he was the only non-Jew who was expelled. So he feels himself to be uh, 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 in a very unique club. The Jews and Tillich were all kicked out of Germany. Uh, they came to England and the United States. He uh, went to the Northeast, and then he's pretty quiet. Um, he's mastering English. He's going to Harvard, writing lots of academic papers. And suddenly in 1952, he writes a book called The Courage to Be, it's not a book about courage. It's not a book about, uh, you know, getting yourself out into the game. Uh, it's, it's at a very deep philosophic level. Uh, it was a popular book, which, which for me is almost unimaginable because part of what he's doing in this idea of the courage to be, he mentions there are, there are basic three ways to be. One is the one who accepts the law of, the, uh, of others, which means religion, the state, where one is just looking to live under a law so that one can escape the, uh, the, the abyss of autonomy. We'd rather somebody else tell us what is, what's up, what it's about, what do we have to do? Because if you have to think for yourself, there's a kind of a vertigo that kicks in. So he's un he understands what happened, I mean, he's trying to understand what happened under Nazism, under communism, and then he sees it, it's, it's in the church, it's everywhere, people... Uh, bar bar bargaining away their freedom for authority. He says, then, another way to be is pure autonomy, the anarchist that says, I don't believe in anything. Nothing is real. Nothing is true. There is no moral order. It's all made up. Uh, you know, I come back to this theme many times, and many very popular modern thinkers go back into this kind of super autonomy anarchist thinking that all values are just made up. 
I hope not. Um, you know, whenever I read someone who says this, they're almost always resting on the fruits of a Western culture that took values seriously. Now, they have the money and time to uh, have a house in, in London. They're not in Ukraine. I think if you're in Ukraine right now, you don't think that values are meaningless and there's not evil in the world. Uh, it, when, e when evil comes up and touches you personally and closely, uh, in my opinion, a lot of that secular atheism and uh, valueless thinking uh, goes out the window because suddenly you realize values do matter. They matter to the point that you are willing uh, to risk your uh, life for them. Uh, so what happens when you go from the anarchic, super autonomous, there are no values, he calls it theonomy, which means the nomos of law under God, but not the God of religion, of something beyond that. And it's a very embryonic idea in the courage to be. And in the beginning of uh, the dynamics of faith, this first, uh, admittedly, very, very confusing part of the book, because in a way, it's the end of an era. Uh, the dynamics of faith is the end of the uh, 18th and 19th century. It's the last, it's the last great hurrah of uh, Kant and Hegel and Fichte and Schelling and all these others. I think after this time, people just didn't write this way. People didn't care about these things. But but Tillich did. Remember, he's in his 60s now, and his uh, you know, and thinking uh, I, I have to write something not for philosophers. Although I think this is a very a book for philosophers. He wanted to get something out to to remind people that there is a God beyond God, and if anything claims you whether it's your religion, your class, your gender, your people, your political views, and that is your criterion for right and wrong, not only is that an, an idolatry, it can, become, it can become a kind of a demonism. And he's seen it. I mean, everybody in Europe saw it when people turned the state into the ultimate concern. Now, uh, Tillich does not talk about what what our ultimate concern ought to be, other than them, is something that we might think with God, but the word God is tainted. Because the word God is so wrapped up with religion that if I say, oftentimes when people say, do I believe in God? I say, yes. They think, well, you think the story of the Garden of Eden was true and the sea uh, parted for these eyes at the Red Sea? I said, that's not what I mean by God. And when people say to me, do you believe in God? I say, I would actually prefer not to answer that question because what you mean and I mean are such completely different things. So what I mean by God was very much shaped for me in reading uh, Tillich's idea of the God beyond God and the job of religion, the, the job of thought, is somehow to, to ground that idea in, in, in a human thought system that never loses uh, its understanding that it is not the final answer. Uh, it is not telling us everything we need to do. Uh, so we're not heteronomous. We're not giving ourselves over to the law that somebody else made up. We're not completely autonomous, meaning there is a value system we live in. Uh, we are theonomous, but we can't define God. So that's the first part of the book. So if you finish this part of the book with a, a little bit of your own vertigo, say, I don't know what he's talking about, uh, part of me wishes he would have written the book in the reverse order. Uh, because the end of the book is so much more clear what he wants to say that it actually gives much uh, shape to the beginning of the book. So, uh, you know, I always say, well, what's the therefore? You know, what's, what's the therefore there for uh, uh, all of you? And the therefore is uh, something that deeply informs our religious culture since Mirav and I founded. Uh, by the way, when, when we dated, we talked about uh, Tillich's... Uh, uh, Tillich's books because I wanted my wife to know who I was and what I thought and and, and where it came from. Uh, that we would we would have a synagogue, and we would have the the delightful symbols of Judaism. You know the the, the depth of the tradition had to be symbolically reflected back upon us. We wanted the immersion in Jewish music, but always remind people that we're not defining God. We're trying to create an experience so that people can experience the God beyond God. When we look at the Torah scroll, that the Torah scroll is a symbol of, of, of the higher law, the higher light, as the rabbis say, the Torah shel mala, the Torah in the higher realms. So, you know, we tried to create 
you know, a, a traditional feel of a community that never lost sight of what Tillich says with some unease, as I'm going to say with some unease, uh, the, the deep mystical foundations of authentic faith. So here's the last thing I'll say. Um, uh, uh, Tillich, when he, when he uses the word faith, he says, I don't mean belief. I don't mean believing things are true with scanty evidence, which is, uh, you know, people believe in the Bible. There's scanty evidence. I still believe it's true. Anyway, he says, okay, that's faith. Uh, he's, that's belief. That's, you know, it's good enough if, if that's where you want to go with this. Uh, for him, faith comes very much out of the incredible humanistic psychology of the first part of the 20th century. For him, faith came out of the actualized personality, the integrated human being, the person who has looked very deeply inside, the person who's not a stranger to themselves, even a stranger to their, to their own shadow. I mean, I think of the beautiful poetry that you bring uh, up, uh, Shanti, every week. T to understand your poetry well, we have to have some kind of personal integration to be able to take the symbolic world of your poets and integrate them into our own sensibilities to understand them and to have them uh, uh, touch us the way that we do. So for Tillich, that was faith. Faith was the integrated personality, even down into the shadows and the depths, including the unknown. So for in the world of belief, there's doubt. But in the world of faith, doubt has a sense of the unknown that I'm struggling with. And with all of that, you say to yourself, I, I'm committing myself to the God beyond God. And sometimes when you look deeply within yourself, sometimes you feel guilt and you feel shame and you feel remorse and you feel you haven't lived up to your potential. Well, you bring that to the God beyond God. So the God beyond God is not just a theoretical idea. It's, you might say it's that to which we can bring the fullness of our being. Um, and, and therefore, for him, authentic religion is the is the totality of one's personality, the totality of one's thinking and feeling, and brought to that to that God beyond God that He does believe is conscious, that He does believe uh, uh, responds to us. So um, when I, I read this book in my introduction to religion class, and I, I I truly say to you, I don't know how I understood it. Uh, you know, I was a well-read kid when I, I began college at 22 years old, and I spent a lot of time reading before I got to college. And I'm reading this book, and I'm looking at some of my markings. And uh, um, this is a timely book. It's a timely book uh, and an eternal book for me. So in the next uh, uh, few, I hope this is meaningful to you. I, I really do. What, what it means for a man like Tillich to lose all of his Lutheranism in the carn and all of his belief in philosophy in the carnage of World War I and rebuild himself as a human being to being what I consider to be the greatest theologian of the 20th century. No other, no other religious tradition has anything that approaches him. By the way, I pulled out his uh, systematic theology uh, that I read when I was in graduate school, uh, volume three. Um, uh, this was uh, the one that we studied. Again, just uh, unparalleled rigorous thinking. And then one of his most delightful books to read, which is his History of Christian Thought, uh, published posthumously uh, from tapes of class lectures. This is a different Paul Tillich. This is Paul Tillich talking to undergraduates. So if you really want a very accessible Paul Tillich and a, a truly interesting and delightful treatment of, uh, of the history of Christian thought, uh, put this by your bed table, read 10 or 20 pages at night. You're going to get super smart. <laughs> You're going to know a lot. And whatever your religion or non-religion is, this is going to make you a, a much uh, deeper and more thoughtful person. So lying in the hospital uh, for those uh, many days, uh, looking at the ceiling in the ICU and the critical care unit and asking myself, uh, what do I want to teach? Uh, what's meaningful to me? What's authentic to me? I remember thinking to myself, I got to get back to Paul Tillich. So, uh, so here we go. I hope uh, you're, you're tightly belted in for this wonderful ride that I want us to, uh, to do together. And always... 
Thank you so much to the members and supporters of Oratora to make all this possible. We do need your membership. We do need your generous support. We can't do this without you. So if you're not yet a member, please become a member. Uh, if you've given generous support in the past, please match that generous support. Uh, we will only have enough longevity for me to get through my, my entire curriculum that I want to get through. The longevity is only going to be there if you support, uh, support our work.